when I'm working on the painting, the painting has to work as a painting. It has to lead the eye. It has to sort of, to set up confusions that then get uh, maybe in some way resolved. If someone calls one of my paintings busy, uh, that's pejorative uh, because I like the complexity to add up to something that that is co cohesive. One of the reasons why uh, I am very deeply into my hero of a painter, and that's Cezanne, and it's been pointed out that he looked forward in the sense that he knew he was doing something different, but he also was looking back. He liked the Venetians and Poussin and uh, Delacroix, and uh, so, uh, uh, what got me into that line of thinking was just was looking at the the structures that are part of the the language. They say, well, the South is is the place of storytelling, maybe not so much of image making, and so narrative narrative art is all right. I I almost uh, shy away from the the. Um, the adjective narrative. Someone suggested, a friend suggested, maybe more allegorical in the sense that I was uh, bringing up the term a little while ago because narrative would be like a, like a, the blinding of Samson by Rembrandt or so many other, other examples. So it's not really narrative, but I guess you follow your main interests and I was always interested in, in, in figuration. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, the the question of how uh, the the musicians, particularly uh, traditional type musicians, get into my paintings, that's a major inf interest of mine. From the time I was a kid, I was interested in playing folk music, and later I've have done a good bit of field recording uh, of traditional or vernacular musicians, blues and. Uh, mountain banjo players, ballad singers, Scottish travelers. In this present group of paintings, uh, in, this, in this show we're, we're talking about, the musicians are in these, some of these more uh, multifaceted settings. Uh, in Abner Jay's case, maybe weeping as he plays, uh, thinking of, of a lot of complicated and painful thoughts. They become part of, uh, of an kind of an allegorical statement that uh, that could be read on, on various levels. But mainly, they're musicians who play the type of music I'm interested in, and they find their way into the figurative world. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say this. This is if I'm casting different personalities in there, and I hope it's done with 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 respect and finding themselves in, in uh, something that's developing in, in my head and in the painterly world that I'm trying to, uh, to uh, uh, re resolve on a, ca on a canvas. Coming to reenactment and uh, the top uh, part of the painting was taken from a Polaroid photograph I took at a Civil War reenactment, and then after the little scene was over, the group threw their hats in the air or stacked their, their guns, and I got this particular Polaroid photograph, and it found its way into uh, a painting which I had uh, you know, a guy and a girl in the foreground looking looking at uh, something, and then there was Abner Jay. He's there as sort of a transitional figure uh, between what's reenactment and what's, what's not. Well, here's uh, Painting Fire, and we were in uh, L.A. in 92, 
Uh, my wife Margo is from LA uh, and uh, so we were visiting her family uh, and that happened to be the same time as the terrible disturbance after the Rodney King verdict came down. We found, we found ourselves on sunset, on the high part of, of the sunset strip looking down the city. So we actually saw the, a city burning, um, made it to uh, my father-in-law's place. He looked down and saw the city where not only he but his father and grandfather had his grandfather uh, settled in L.A. in the 1850s. Um, but uh, it was uh, something you don't forget to see a city, a city burning even from a distance. And, and I don't really remember how the painting, which I did when I was back, back here in Georgia, how it actually started, but it started accumulating various elements. And there is a self-portrait. Um, as the observer, you know, because I'm, I'm taking a picture or or put myself in, in in that in that role. That has happened in other paintings. And there's an easel, and then there's a there's a couple, a nude couple, which were, they were painted from life. Uh, I liked the figure. I liked uh, drawing a figure, and I also have painted uh, numerous paintings of of couples, sometimes nude and sometimes clothed. I like to paint more than one, one figure and also put them into a composition at times where other stuff is going on. And they're wondering what sometimes there's an awareness or a, di a distraction. Well, there's one figure on the right is Big Jim Griffith, who's a friend of mine who's a folklorist in, in uh, Arizona. I had uh, maybe a photograph of of him and there's also the, the African American man Abner J is in the painting and he's um, play, he's playing the the banjo and he's become kind of a cult figure recently. He's uh, he called himself the last old minstrel man and I I encountered him at a couple of banjo conclaves and and he had a little truck that he took around and he sang a whole smorgasbord of different kinds of songs from pop folk to old minstrel songs and he said and and so he was uh, maybe he's kind of a, a, a witness to the the whole thing there was something that the painting needed and in the back of uh, the art building I observed there was a long aluminum rod that was used as extension for a paintbrush that the people were painting the building used to get up in the nooks and cra crevices uh, so I, they were finished with it. I took it to the studio and I put an uh, artist brush on the end of it and, and had it come right into the composition from, from, from the left. And it, to my mind, it animated that space and, and sort of solved the, the various angles in space that were, were uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the painting. And it was something that, that that it needed. So um, then it also, this was kind of an afterthought, but it, it did um, pose a, a, a question of who is painting the painting. To what extent are we all in, in, involved in these societal and, per, and, and uh, political and other uh, questions that cause problems that we, we, we still have. I think of something that, um, that, that, uh, that Gustin said, um, he's, uh, when people were finding a political commentary in his work, which maybe was part of it, but he said he'd rather be a poet than a pamphleteer. Uh, you, and that resonated with me, the importance of the the documenter or the photographer, or the filmer, in the painting, and sometimes it's it's myself, sometimes it's it's uh, someone else. Um, the painting of Dilmas Hall, who is a wonderful self-taught artist who lived here in Ath Athens, Georgia, and uh, uh, did a painting. Oh, the painting is called "A Man Has Been Here a Long Time." He. Uh, was in the African American regiments in World War World War One, and so 
the, the painting uh, is sort of his world um, because the, I had a, a, a Stereopticon card of a, of a, of a regiment of African Americans that, that taken at that at that time. Um, he wasn't necessarily in it, but he was one of those uh, soldiers who went went to to Europe. He um, and so I want to evo evoke that as uh, a part of his past. The present was him stand, standing there looking at, at the viewer. And um, then there's a young white couple that uh, were making a video f film of him. And he was a wonderful talker. And, a, and his yard was full of amazing sculptures. One of them was the devil throwing a rock at, a, at a two drunkards. Uh, one of his masterpieces. These were concrete uh, sculptures that were about three quarters life size that were in his in his yard, which uh, had uh, uh, amazing and wonderful art in it. Um, he gave the painting its title. Didn't pose for it directly, but I, he knew I was working on it from some photographs. And he, my studio was not too far from where he lived, and I heard him walking up the stairs one day. He, I told him exactly where it was, and he was able to go over and look at it. And he said, he recognized himself, he said, a man has been here a long time, because he was in his later years, and then he, he re saw the soldiers, and then, and then uh, uh, there's a magnolia tree. He said, I planted that from a pencil, meaning it was a little little shoot. And, and so there were uh, these different aspects of his of his life, so um, yeah, I, I hope it was treated uh, respectfully. And then the young couple is like uh, they're they're documenting their they so to put it in simple terms as past, what was then the present, and then the future. Because there's that they if you take a video or a photograph, that's that carries something of the past time into into the future. So that's uh, something I'm well aware of as, as uh, an element that occurs in a, uh, a lot of the work. And it uh, it also let the viewer know in a kind of very explicit way that this is not a, a peek into the past or a colorful world of the past or an event, but, but a modern world with our microphones uh, uh, and cameras, and now phones, kind of, kind of uh, there and looking, and for, for better or worse. There was a, a guy named Rice uh, in uh, Prattville, Alabama, a little, uh, little town in a rural area, and who covered his property on both sides of, of a two-lane road with with crosses and biblical uh, and religious uh, signs. And there were lots of them, lots of them. And so I went and, and visited him and, um, and we had a nice uh, conversation. And uh, he was uh, very, very uh, religious, fundamentalist Christian. And so I did a, a portrait of him in, in his environment. And again, there are observers. There's, uh, uh, a young guy painting, so he's, I use the strategy of painting, uh, a painting within a painting to get a couple of other views of him because he wore a kind of a crucifixion around his neck and sort of wanted to break up what would be a normal kind of u unity composition with something that was a little more uh, 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 complex but nevertheless plausible, so it's a painting within within a painting and then at the very bottom there's a palette and a brush coming in so that's someone painting a painting of someone painting a painting of whatever so and then there was another uh, young lady who's uh, observing it and I uh, I really uh, didn't have a, uh, an ulterior purpose you, you know like the uh, the kind of intense uh, re religiosity that uh, that was so much a part of this man was was not part of anything that 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 I personally identify with, but 
but he projected very strongly, so that became the, uh, the subject matter. Well, the painting called Woodville uh, is named after a little tiny town here in, uh, in North Georgia, and uh, my interest in uh, vernacular or folk art or whatever you want to call it uh, 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 helped me meet some really interesting people. We've talked about Howard Finster and Domus Hall, and the Reverend John Ruth had a Bible and history garden in his uh, property in this little town of Woodville, Georgia. But uh, people went to see what he was doing, what he'd created, and uh, that was uh, the, uh, what generated this painting. The scene is very different. He lived in a piney grove that was very flat. Somehow I decided to put it on a hillside looking at a, a, a river. And uh, uh, Typically, you'd go and, and visit him, and he'd uh, want to instruct the visitors, and so it showed a group of, uh, of, of students, a, a student group that had, that had uh, come along, and they found their way into the painting. And he was playing a little uh, kind of electric organ and singing s spirituals, and his garden consisted of sculptures, some of them biblical and some of them uh, historical because he'd been a history teacher and he talked about world history. And the idea was that this would be a drive-through experience. Uh, and uh, made, I made a lot of changes but did use some elements from his garden and sort of like the idea of the globe uh, which was part of his uh, historical sculpture sec section. It was hanging from a branch, but kind of like the idea of, of carrying the eye into a river rather than his uh, landscape, but also wanted to kind of show him in action, doing what he did. He would sing and play and, and talk about his, his ideas to, vi to, uh, to visitors. There are stories in these paintings, and there's a cast of characters, but there are also structures, and as I look at it, uh, I see that, that there's a pyramid composition, or several pyramid compositions, and the, the head of Christ would be at the, at the uh, apex of, of, uh, of one of them. Maybe the group of, fig of students have an, has another one, uh, you could draw little dotted lines if you want to be analytical, and uh, I certainly didn't invent that. Uh, that's part of the, the language, and we've got this language, and some painters have said, well, they want to reinvent the language, uh, and that's great, and some have done it. You want know, to make maybe Malevich and white on white, that's a reinvention of, of, of painting. In the painting circles, uh, there were two two models, and they were models I think that uh, were nude models in the in the art school. So, uh, uh, and as I said before, I'm interested in pa in painting the figure, and my inclination would be to extend the world they're in, or place them in some place where there are a lot of other as associative things going on. And not in that particular painting, I wonder if. Uh, if it's pushing it a little bit to have them on that tower. Uh, in other places, like they're in an environment and then there's a window or something else going on beyond. Uh, but there it is, that's the way it happened. The, the tower, Reverend Howard Finster was you know, really uh, amazing artist in his paintings and in this paradise garden that uh, is having an ongoing life of sorts. But one of his most impressive works was a a kind of a tower that he built out of bicycle frames and lawnmower frames because he was uh, he was a preacher, but uh, that's not a full-time job if you're a, a, a living in a rural area in, in northwest Georgia. That uh, he uh, repaired bicycles and and lawnmowers, and so he built this tower which you could go into at one point and had like concentric like pathways and. And it was as interesting to me as any uh, mainstream, large-scale contemporary sculpture. It, uh, eventually it got covered with vines and, and kind of dangerous, but that became a kind of central structure. 
And I put myself with a camcorder. Michael Stipe happened to be at one of the North Georgia folk festivals that I helped organize over the years, and maybe that came from a little snapshot I, I took of him. But he came there with his, uh, he's a gifted photographer and, uh, and gifted in visual media as well as, as music. And uh, the dancers were the dancers that were at, at, the, uh, at the festival, so they were circling around. The, the folks, people I've painted uh, are people that I've met through my interest in, in uh, vernacular art and traditional music. And we come from very different backgrounds, but uh, I think we, you know, have, we're respectful of each, of each other and uh, realize that we get in, involved in, uh, in human and cultural interaction. And I think that those are not beyond the right to discuss or criticize, but they also are part of our, our freedom as, as artists. Well, this uh, diptych is called My Mind Will Never Be Easy, spelled A-I-S-Y, and that's, that's uh, the name of an Irish fiddle tune, a, a slip jig in 9-8 time, and uh, the way it's written in O'Neill's book of, of Irish fiddle tunes, they have little, little uh, uh, air quotes around AZ uh, as if it's to be noted that it's a kind of an I Irish uh, pronunciation. I like the idea, my mind will never be AZ because uh, we all have a, a lot or a little of the Weltschmerz or anxiety uh, nowadays and into the past. The painting's pretty pretty complex. Again, I had a, a couple of um, of art students who said they'd be in a painting, um, and I painted them from life. Uh, the man with the dog is my good friend Doc Barnes, who's a gospel and spiritual singer and guitar player. Uh, the figure in the in the middle, Naomi Bradford. Uh, was a wonderful singer, and we were invited to uh, Doc and Lucy's church uh, in the 70s, shortly after we met them and moved to Athens, Georgia. And she, her, her singing kind of rose up to, uh, to uh, wonderful inspirational levels when she would sing. She was a thrilling singer. I don't participate in the particular religion that's, that is the content of the song, but the feeling of the song is, is wonderful. So, uh, and also visually, she was, she, she was an elderly woman, but she would move with, with the song. And so somehow she found herself in the kind of split of the two sections of the painting. And uh, it was a kind of a cumulative painting with elements taken from various sources. The little area above Doc Barnes's head is uh, from a, a Polaroid photograph I took of, uh, of a little circular driveway. I found that the painting formed dualities. On the right side, uh, the upper side, is uh, there's a self-portrait with my Polaroid camera photographing the viewer, or I was actually photographing myself in the uh, mirror in a railroad train in, in, in uh, Europe. And during that year, one time we had the TV set on and uh, my son and I were watching, uh, just casually watching, there was a soccer game going on. We didn't even know what was happening, but the, the announcer said, oh, this is terrible. This is a, a, a brawl going on. They're, they're coming and taking uh, people out on stretchers. And it was uh, at, in Brussels, and it was a, a game between uh, Liverpool and Turin, and there was a, uh, a brawl and a riot, and there were several deaths, uh, and we got a lot of coverage in magazines. I think that image came partly from that. Some of the photographs showed a, a kind of a, ca a cascade of shoes that were falling over the, the bleachers after the event was over. Was a, a lot of people had lost their shoes, so they kind of piled down in over a little wall. And in the foreground is is a couple who uh, are involved in their own own world, as if they're 
oblivious to what's going on outside the, the window, which I think is part of our experience. You know, we, we live our lives, our intimate lives, or our personal lives, and sometimes something pretty uh, disturbing is, is uh, happening right outside the window. And then one other element is in the lower right-hand corner, just to kind of show that this was there was a European element, because the left side is America, the right side is Europe. Uh, there are two self-portraits, there are two couples, and there are two continents. I'd been reading a uh, short story by, by Brecht called Ein Neues Gesicht. It's a, a short little vignette about a, a very rapacious businessman who uh, was a, a cruel and nasty person. And one, one day he, his chauffeur looked back and saw him and got horrified. And when he got the businessman got ho home, he looked at himself in the mirror. He had become a tiger. In other words, he'd literally become a tiger. Ich hatte ein neues Gesicht bekommen. Uh, I had gotten a new face. I was a, I was a tiger. And then I noticed that some of the figures in the in the painting of the brawl were wearing yellow and black striped garments, and that my own shirt was yellow and, and black, like like tiger stripes. And and that was not by intention. It just was one of those things that seemed to make some connection, and maybe it was in, in, intuitive. I've, I have been working uh, on pastels and abstract pastels pretty intensively for the last two or three years, uh, and I'm working on some now. They're my current work in the studio is a continuation of, of that, and I have been working in this more abstract mode uh, for a long time. In my MFA show at Columbia, I had abstract work, very derivative of, from of Philip Guston's work at the, at the time, I will have, have to admit that. Recently, I, I really like uh, to work in the, in the soft pastels because you can get a, a lot of intensity. It's very freeing, actually, to do the pastels in one sense because I don't have to deal with, with a, with, representation or doing a, a, a gunky, clumsy arm or something. Um, but there are other kinds of, of demands or that doing the pastels will make. One I, no one I notice is when uh, I find myself doing something that is mainly uh, sensory enjoyment, like a color against color or, oh, hey, I like that, that shape, that, that makes me want to sort of push it aside and, and move more towards something that, that has a, a story to tell. But I somehow have this nagging need to get some kind of expressive or storytelling thing in the abstract work. Matisse said that, you know, that a color and the subject is color against color. It's not an expressive face or a gesture, that arrangement of colors on a surface. That's what he's after. Yeah.